you so much. I just uh, stopped by to just say hi to everyone because I have to go and eat my birthday dinner with my family. And I'll see you guys later. Thank you so much for having me today. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Bye. Happy birthday. Uh, Carolina, we voted uh, unanimous, unanimously to uh, have Carolina take over the Progressive Democrats of America, which is a huge national organization fighting for progressive values within and without the inside and outside the party. So Carolina, you want to go ahead and start and then I'll get the live going and we'll come back to Emily, okay? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you everybody who was there to vote. And also, I, I did take on the, the responsibility um, more, more because it was a way to honor and to continue the work that Mitchell was doing. And I am very excited right now because I received my first major assignment from the statewide PDA, which was to try to get a meeting, a Zoom meeting with Congressman Deutsch, Ted Deutsch, uh, to talk about Medicare for All and try to, to get him on board with that. As you know, that's one of the main work that, that PDA is doing. And I really didn't think that, that I was going to, to get it. I, I thought that it was going to take a lot more pushing to try to get even on that, on that table with him. And we have a meeting already on, on place, and that's going to be on August 25th. We're very excited for that. We're thankful to his staff for organizing this with us. And as we continue to get closer to that date, we have started programming this and getting some additional support. So right now, we have the statewide uh, Progressive Caucus that has unanimous, unanimously endorsed our mission with that. We have also the national DFA with us. We have, well, we have the, the statewide PDA, obviously. We have our little organization that Mitchell and, and I and a few others created that's called Healthcare is an Act of Love. And we have been lobbying and we have been doing mobilizations since the pandemic started. Uh, that they are going to be also with, with us. National Nurses Union is considering joining us. We already have some of the members on board. We have Public Citizen with us and Physicians for National Health Program is also considering. We have also with us the Broward Life, um, the Black Lives Alliance Brian, uh, Broward and we have Dream Defenders Broward also with us. And uh, so we're, we're, you know, we're very, very excited. We're getting that uh, moving. We have already had one uh, group meeting with all of us to try to, to tackle who are going to be the speakers, how long we're going to have the speaking portion. And the main thing here is that we want to have a dialogue with the Congressman and hopefully get him on board with us. So very excited. Hopefully some of you can join us. That's going to be August 25th and it's going to be at 10.30 in the morning. We're going to create a Facebook event in what, and we're going to, to publish it in our, in our Facebook page. Very cool, very cool. Thank you, Carolina. And I wanted to introduce you to Jacob who has taken over for our revolution. Uh, that's Jacob in the corner, yay. <laughs> and uh, not in the middle. Um, because- Hi, everybody. And he'll get back with us next month about anything that's that wow. we need to know. Could we hear a little more about it? You're taking over the Our Revolution Broward? Yeah, I, I signed up uh, to take up uh, Mitchell's Our Revolution Broward, but Thank as you. of now, I don't quite know what my duties are supposed to be, so I have to, Me neither. with everybody's <laughs> help, I have to figure out what it is I'm supposed that to be doing. That is so great, man. Where are you from, Florida? Yeah, I stay in Weston and I work in Sunrise. Have you been to our meetings and stuff? Uh, only it's Jacob, John. <laughs> I'm not sure I know you personally. <laughs> no, Jacob, I you only have? started recently. But... You look so, so familiar, but I'm trying. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thank you for helping out. Okay. Well, and before we get to Emily, I did want to tell you that about the GoFundMe for Mitchell. We 
collected after the, their fees and taxes or whatever it is. We, we got $4,600 in Mitchell's GoFundMe. So we gave $2,800 to Mitchell's family and they were extremely grateful. I mean, she calls me still once a week to tell me how, how, how wonderful we have, we're all for her family. And we gave $1,000 to Progressive Democrats of America. And while they can't earmark it in Mitchell's name, he said anything else that comes in, which we have since gotten another $500 in, into the fund, anything that comes in, we can earmark for a scholarship in Mitchell's name. So we can, when our next board meeting, we'll choose what that scholarship is. And, and on that note, I wanted to say congratulations to Jonathan Harrington, who got a scholarship to University of Florida, correct? And he'll be studying yeah. law. So what we might want to do with that money is go ahead and find maybe a couple, you know, a couple of college kids who can use kids, whatever, <laughs> adults <laughs> that uh, could use could use some money. So we'll, we'll figure that out at the next board meeting. But I just want to thank everybody who contributed, and I think that Mitchell would be really proud. For scrutineers and scrutineers is an online resource center for people all over the country who are dedicated to securing our elections. Um, it's it's fantastic. She's got all kinds of experts and all kinds of, uh, of seminars and resources and just really good information gathering place. You can go and get volunteers for certain projects. Uh, she's been in election security since I think in 2002 and worked almost all over the country uh, on different projects. And I will let Emily take it away from here. Thank you so much for being with us, Emily. You're welcome. And thank you so much for inviting me, Jamie. And I just, I want to start out by apologizing for not being on camera. I'm actually not feeling well today. And this was the compromise we reached where I could still do this and be here with you and, and have it be a little bit less stress on my body. So, um, so you get a picture of me, but it's a still picture, and, and I apologize for that. I'm, I'm delighted to be here with you, and it's, it was great. I've been on for about uh, 20 minutes, and it's great to hear how much you've got happening and how many organizations you have working together. I, I live in San Francisco, where people think of it as being kind of a, maybe a more organized progressive community than, than maybe we are, and I'm really impressed by what I'm seeing. I know... Um, I know in Broward you have had a lot of um, challenges to to your election, shall we say. I was there in September of 2018 um, in Hollywood for a, a, an election protection forum that was sponsored by Audit Elections USA. I don't know if any of you were there, but I was one of the I think I was there. That's so great. At, at that forum, yeah. And that was, it was amazing to be in Broward after having heard about it um, for so long and kind of see what it was like a little bit on the ground there. So I want to honor all of you for hanging in there with a really, really challenging situation. And I see that, that Ellen, who has been in this work I, longer than I have, I, it's actually 2004 that I started, not 2002, um, and I, has gone to jail to stand up for the elections in, in your county. So. Um, I salute you. And um, so Jamie asked me to come on and give you a little pep talk and um, assure you that working on election protection is not a tinfoil hat occupation. And I have to say, you know, when I started out doing this work in 2004, we got treated a lot like we were out of our minds, like we got called conspiracy theorists all the time, told we were wearing tinfoil hats. I had to look it up to find out what that was, and it sounded pretty good to me, so I made one. Um, <laughs> and I'm just kidding. And, um, and even in progressive circles, we were kind of treated like pariahs. Nobody wanted to hear what we had to say. And my experience was talking to white people about what was what I saw going on with elections and what I was learning about the vulnerability of our election systems. My sense was they didn't want to believe it because they counted too much on elections. And talking to black people about it, the response tended to be, yeah, what else is new? Surprise me about how unfair the system is. And nobody wanted to get involved. It, it, um, white, black, brown, and of, anyone, no one of any race seemed to want to get involved. And it was very lonely work for a long time. And a few things have really changed now. And one of those is that the 
the idea of election security being an issue that we should pay attention to has been in the news a lot with um, the Russia investigation. And But what I've found is that while people are much more familiar with this term election security, they still don't really know what it means. And I think if you ask most people, what are the concerns about election security, the response you will get will have the word Russia in it. And that's really not the only concern. If we had a secure system, it wouldn't matter who was trying to, to manipulate it, whether it was people in Russia or any other country or people within the US. If we, if we had a system that really paid attention to security, but we don't. And as a result, there are all kinds of risks, both from outside the US, from inside the US, from outside election election departments from inside election departments. And, um, and I think another thing that people tend not to know is that there's anything that anybody can do about it. And I'm delighted that some of your member groups actually have figured that out and have been, have been involved in what I think are some of the most important election protection activities that, any, that anyone can do with the systems we have now. And in particular, I want to cite three things. One is everything you're doing to get people registered and voting is a really important voting rights. I see voting rights and election security as kind of two hands of the of the creature that is election protection in general. And so, um, so that work is really important. It's really important to um, the functioning of our democracy. And then on the election security side, two particular things are the protection of digital ballot images, which Jamie just told me this morning, has you were able to secure the promise that those will not be destroyed in Broward County, even though that issue is under litigation right now. Jamie, do you want to add anything about that? Do folks who are on this call already know about that? Yeah, we talked about it a little bit earlier. Um, and, okay. and so far, that's only for the primaries. We, we still need to keep our, our, our foot on the ground, our foot on his neck, <laughs> so to speak, for the for the uh, general. But we'll, we'll keep you we'll keep you in the loop there too, Emily. Okay. Okay. And and as you may know, and I don't I I don't know like I know you're a bunch of different groups coming together on this call, and so I'm not altogether clear who knows what. Um, so what I want to say is that digital ballot images. Um, can be used in a few different ways. And I know that we've got some candidates on the call and I think this is particularly relevant to you. Um, because if, when those images are preserved, it gives, if you can get access to them, it gives you the opportunity to verify the election results by actually counting the votes in the race where you're running. It, it's it's really a lot to try to count all the all the votes for every race, but to be able, but to count all the votes for one race is not necessarily out of the question in a in a an area the size of of Broward County. Also, the um, I believe you have ESNS um, voting machines there. Is that right? You have the yes, that's right. Um, and when you, what's produced by that system is not only the ballot images, but also a document that is basically an Excel spreadsheet that goes by different names. It, it, it's, it's sometimes called the cast vote record, which is confusing because there's another document that's called that too. It's sometimes referred to as the list of vote records, but it's basically and I, I know I'm getting into the weeds here and I, and I won't go too far, I promise. Okay, I'm paying attention to, to how, far, how far I go in describing this, but I think it's important and very little known. Um, so this spreadsheet has on it a column for every race on the ballot and a row for every voter so that you can't tell who the voter is. You're, they're identified by a number but you can sort that, if you can get hold of that spreadsheet in addition to the ballot images, you can sort the spreadsheet in ways that make it really easy to look at stuff. So for example, just because it's, it's an Excel spreadsheet, you can do all the things with it you could do with any other spreadsheet. So for example, you could sort it for anything that's blank in, in a particular column so that all of the undervotes, the people whose votes were not recorded in a particular race, show up together and you can look and see how many is that or how, or, and so 
if there is, for example, a problem with ballot design, which Florida is famous for with the butterfly ballot, and there was also an issue in 2018 with ballot design um, ending up with a lot fewer vote, votes in a, a congressional race that you had. Um, it's, it's sometimes easy to tell that that's what's going on if you can see that, that um, you can see what's blank or you can see combinations of votes that voters have made. We have all these votes that are progressive for every other race, but this one race where there's a ton of people who voted for these five progressive candidates in other races, but in this race, they voted for the conservative candidate, for example. You can, you can see stuff like that without actually counting every ballot. So that's hugely um, important in a number of ways. So. So I encourage you to try to get a hold of those um, through, you'll probably have to do a public records request. You can't do that until the records are created in Florida is my understanding. You can't do a public records request for records that haven't been created yet, even if they are going to be created and you know it. So um, to have those public records request, requests ready to go as soon as the election is over so that you can hopefully get that material quickly, which I know is a challenge, um, is something we'd really recommend. Um, so, so ballot images are that working to get hold of them and use them to verify the election is one really important thing to do. Another really important thing to do is to take photographs of the poll tapes on election night. And Jamie tells me that that's something that you're organizing to do next week for your primary. Is that, do I have that right? You got that right. For our, and okay. we're doing in, in the uh, early voting as well too. And do you want me to say why that's important or do people know? No, please say that's why. I like being backed up. <laughs> okay, so, so for anyone who doesn't know, what the poll tapes are, are records that come, that are from each, each machine in the precinct. So um, the, the accessible machines that are generally touchscreen machines that um, produce these and also the scanners that paper ballots are fed into produce these. They look like a cash register receipt and they have on them the totals for every race for that machine. And in some places, I believe including in Florida, it's required that they be posted publicly outside the each polling place. So you can go around to the polling places after polls close and it usually it takes an hour to a few hours before they're posted and take pictures or videos, video of them. It's the closest that we can get to kind of real time results. And the, the reason that that's important is that sometimes the vote counts change after the counts from the individual machines are brought to the supervisor of elections office and aggregated with the votes from other places. And if, and this is the, this would be evidence that the, that, that changes. So you, the idea is to take photographs or videos of the poll tapes and compare the numbers on them with the precinct level results that hopefully will be posted on your SOE websites. So um, this is one of the ways, I, have you all talked about, Jamie, have you talked about Benny Smith and Fraction Magic at all? Uh, no, I, you know, I didn't want to delve into that because it's, it's a little technical and, 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 you know, yeah, no, I haven't talked about Fraction Okay, so let me say, say this. You may have heard the term Fraction Magic, and you may not have. There's the, there is a, an amazing man in Memphis, Tennessee named Benny Smith who discovered several years ago and did a huge research project with blackboxvoting.org to expose that the voting systems in this country have a built-in vulnerability. It was actually built to be a feature, it's not a bug, that allows um, elections to be run as weighted races where some voters' votes count as more than one whole number and some voters' votes count as less than one whole number. We have, I, we've got um, an interview, he and I did an, uh, an evening presentation together in Scrutineers that, that you're welcome to come and watch if you'd like. And I also interviewed him for our podcast. And I'll give you the links to those things where he, he explains the situation. Um, the only way we, ways we have to detect whether that 
exploit is running in a particular election are to count the votes on the ballot images or to compare the poll tape results to the official vote count. So those are two hugely important things and I want to congratulate you for being involved in them. They're not, they're not both possible everywhere, but they are both possible where you are because you use equipment that produces dig digital ballot images in your election and poll tapes have to be posted. So um, let's see. What, so one of the things that's really different this year, I, I mentioned that there were a couple of things and I talked about one of them being that people now will talk about election security. The other is that we have a runaway president who's claiming that the election is going to be rigged and who's saying that we can't that we can't trust the voting systems that we can't trust to vote by mail I mean, obviously i guess the other thing that's different about this year is covid and all of the implications of that for for our elections um and we have so we have the republican party that seems to be going along with those accu accusations and the democratic party that is falling into what i believe is a trap that's being set by the Trump administration, which is responding to those accusations by saying, oh, that's ridiculous, our election systems are safe. So then what happens if in fact the election is manipulated, but it's manipulated on behalf of Republican candidates? The Democrats are not going to be in a position to be able to, to expose and, and claim that the elections, that any election has been stolen, if they've been saying, no, trust the system, trust the system, trust the system. So the way I see it is that everybody in both parties needs to be saying, we demand that the election offices be able to prove that the election results are correct. And we, as communities, and I don't want to say as citizens because not all of us are citizens, and those of us who are not citizens and can't vote can still participate in election protection activities. Um, or those of us who, who can't vote because of um, felony convictions, and I know that there's, that's a big scene in Florida right now, and all, or people who can't vote because they're not 18 yet can still participate in election protection activities. So I really b believe that what we need to be doing is saying we have to enhance voter confidence, but we need to do that by proving that the election results are correct and that we as communities can participate in that if you let us see count the votes. We can check the computer counts. We can, you know, see the evidence of what's going on and make our elections more transparent. So, so that's something that, that our organization Scrutineers is really working on is trying to um, enhance this idea that of focusing on voter confidence, not by placating voters into thinking there's reason for confidence now, but by demanding that things be done and offering support to see that things are done in a way that inspires a reason that ha that creates a reason for confidence. So, um, I mentioned before that it's really important that candidates are here and I, uh, tonight, and I wanted to say a few things to you specifically and about that. And um, that said, I don't know what I mean. I assume. I don't know what parties any of you belong to or if you're running for nonpartisan races. Scrutineers is a nonpartisan organization. And so this is not about, I'm not campaigning for any of you. This is information I would give to any candidate of any party or a candidate in a nonpartisan race. In many cases, candidates have a role to play that no one else can play. Even though I absolutely believe that, vote, that elections don't belong to the candidates, they belong to the voters, the laws are not always written that way. So there are some kinds of election challenges that only candidates have legal standing to mount. And I don't know if that's true in Florida. Does anyone who's here know that? Yes, only you have to prove injury. And the only one that can prove injury is the candidate. And incidentally, we were also just at a meeting where only the candidates were allowed to be seated due to the COVID pandemic. Right. At the accuracy test, they only allowed the candidates in. So, th so those, are, those are really important reasons to get as many candidates as you can involved in this work. 
because they may need to be the eyes and ears of the community. And then the other thing is that candidates who have good community support have volunteers whose work for the campaign, if I understand it correctly, is generally done on election night. But some of the most important election protection activities happen after the close of polls on election night, starting with photographing of poll tapes, going into um, the doing a count or analysis of ballot images, observing post-election auditing procedures, those sorts of things can be done by those people who are done with their volunteer effort for your campaign. And so if you can help your, your volunteers prepare for that role, that can be really helpful too. It's really, it, it can be really a tricky thing about doing this work that um, in big election years, which is kind of the only time anybody wants to pay attention to this stuff, the people who care most about the election tend to be really busy campaigning for candidates before the elections. And, and then, and there's some election protection activities, a lot of them that are needed before elections, but then there's really intense stuff that happens after the elections and we need to be training the folks who are campaigning to be ready to step into those roles. So I wanna really encourage you to think about it that way, talk to your volunteers about it that way. You can um, have your staff or volunteers come join scrutineers and go through some of the training we have to prepare them to be ready. And I wanna really encourage you to do that. Um, so then let me talk a little bit about, I feel almost done and I just wanna tell you a little bit more about what Scrutineers is. And Jamie, I have to say, I always like to hear people describe it because it's kind of a new thing that we're doing. And sometimes I discover things we haven't communicated clearly about who we are and what we're doing by hearing other people describe it. And you did a fantastic job. So thank you. Um, I'm glad that this is recorded because I actually like to, to offer that to other people. Scrutineers, um, just, we just opened our doors, our, our online doors in January, and we exist to support the election protection movement, voting rights and election security groups and activists who are working in that field, um, candidates who want to train their volunteers, it, that sort of thing. So the idea is there just, there hasn't ever before been a way that people could learn about these complex issues and learn how to take action on them. So we've created an online community that has training sessions. We have live training sessions and then you can watch the recording afterwards if they've already happened when you get there. We have discussion boards where people can ask their questions and talk to each other and meet in small groups. We've got groups for, for each state where we have members. Florida is, is one, one that we have a number of members, including Jamie. And, um, and so, so it's, it basically serves as a resource center and place that people can connect. They can learn there, they can connect there, they can find out what actions there are to take and take action. So we're helping people determine what actions make the most sense where they live based on things like what the, the laws and regulations are and what kinds of voting systems are in use and what races are particularly hot this year and, and all kinds of considerations like that. We also have, we actually are having an orientation for new members tomorrow at one in the afternoon your time. And um, we have an, another event coming up on Monday the 24th with Jonathan Simon, who's the author of Code Red, uh, an important book about protecting the elections from elections in the election security area. He's, go he's gonna be doing a, an interview with me that night. And, and we have a Scrutineers podcast, which we do in collaboration with whowhatwhy.org. That, which you may be familiar with. They've actually covered a lot of, of Broward County election um, problems in the past. So you can, you can find that on your podcast episode as, uh, in your podcast app rather, as Who, What, Why's podcasts, or go to whowhatwhy.org and the episodes are there. And they also um, do a rough transcript of each episode. So if you prefer to read rather than listen, that's available too. So if you go to our website, which is scrutineers.org, what you'll see there is not very much. You'll see a homepage and an invitation to join the community, which unfortunately you have to do by clicking on a button that has text on it that makes no sense at all. It says, choose a plan. Um, and that's because that's the 
the platform that our site is built on doesn't make that customizable. So it just, it, I apologize for that. We charge a one-time fee of $1.99 for people to join. And the reason for that is um, to keep bots out of the site and to discourage trolls from joining and disrupting because who they are is somewhat traceable because they've had to put down a, a credit or debit card to join. And so far that seems to be working. And um, I know it's a little bit odd for people to think about paying to get into something like that. Once you're in there, there's a ton, a ton of information and you can connect with people. We've got close to 600 members already. We want to grow to 10,000 by the general election. Um, and then the, the one final thing that I'll say is that we also, rec we also welcome organizations to become members. Um, and or for organizations, we kind of function like, um, I don't know if you're familiar with co-working spaces where there's one office building where different companies can have offices in and they each get their own private office, but they share a meeting room, conference rooms and AV equipment and maybe a coffee pot and um, things like that, but they can come there and do their work in a, in a place that has opportunity for collaboration with others. So we have, we have a setup kind of like that. And if you'd like to explore that, you're welcome to contact me at emily at scrutineers.org or private message me through the site and I can tell you more about that. So um, I, think, I think that completes what I want to say. I am really thrilled to know that you are there doing the work that you're doing and really um, I'm, I appreciate it a lot. It's, you, you know, you know, you know that, well, I don't know, maybe you don't know. Do you know that Broward is notorious throughout the country for our, the election messes that have happened there? Like, yeah, I, yeah. And Ellen, you are part of of sounding the alarm for sure and have been for years. Yeah. So I'm happy to, to take any questions and thanks so much for the opportunity to be here with you all. All right, thank you, Emily. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, yeah, just, uh, what was that podcast again? Um, so it's, it's we're, who, what, why dot org is the website that you go to and it's a project we're doing in collaboration with that site so it's called the scrutineers series and there have only been i think four or five episodes so far um but you'll find them there one of them is with benny smith who who um is famous for discovering fraction magic which i mentioned earlier one is with um Barbara Arnwine of the Voting Rights Alliance, one's with Mimi Kennedy. Um, we just recorded one that's coming up with Jennifer Cohn that will be released in a couple weeks. And I think there might be one more that I'm forgetting so far. I see that this is big to that website. They have um, election integrity under threats to democracy. So yeah, they, they, do, a, a they do a lot on that topic. I'm going to search up the scrutineers. Yeah, or if you go to the podcast tab. You can find it there. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, I thought I would ask about um, San Francisco. You said you organized there, right? You know, it's funny. I live here. I actually have only lived, I, I grew up here and moved away for 30 years. And now I'm, I just moved back here right before COVID hit. And I have done very little um, election protection work in San Francisco or even in California. I've been more focused nationally all this time. Totally understand. I wondered if um, they might have any, if we might learn from each other in any way, if you have anything to say about living in San Francisco and the way things are done there, really about anything. Personally, I've never been. Well, one of the things is that um, the county of San Francisco announced some months back that they were going to be posting ballot images online so that people could download them and count them, which is something that's happening in very few places around the country. Dane County, Wisconsin being one of the places where, I think that's where it happened first. Um, and then our Secretary of State announced that ballot images were not to be released to the public, not even, not even on a thumb drive. And so that's something we're fighting right now to be able to access them. We're, we, we don't have the problem as far as we know of them being destroyed, like is happening in, in some counties in Florida and is the reason that that lawsuit is going on now. Um, but they apparently are trying not to give us access to them. Why, Ellen says, um, 
I think a big part of the whole, the whole ballot image issue is that election officials don't understand what they are. So sometimes they think that they have private information on them, which they shouldn't. I mean, somebody could technically write their name on a ballot and that would show. Um, they're not supposed to do that, but they could. So, um, so I think a lot of it is not really understanding and what they are, why they're important. I don't know. It's hard for me to explain. Doubt. I, no I think they, they know exactly what they are. Can I ask, um, so how did they do that in the county of San, uh, where San Francisco is? Was that something the supervisor of elections attempted to do? Or did, how could we emulate that here? Um, we actually don't have supervisors of elections in California. We have um, registrar, registrar of voters is usually the, the name of the local election official or county clerk, or there may be some other, it's, it's not organized in the same way as it is in Florida. Um, so it's the kind of thing that I believe in most cases is probably a local decision except for when it's usurped by a statewide decision, like is currently the case in California. Um, it, it, so one thing that you could do is you could go to Dane County, Wisconsin's website, and you can look, if you look at the past elections area, you will find ballot images from, it, from past elections there, and you can see how they have it set up. Um, I don't know the history of how that came to be. I believe it was voluntary on the part of the the elections department or whatever it's called there, I don't even know of there being a group that was advocating for it. I think they took it on themselves to do it. That would be amazing. I mean, imagine that, Jamie. Yeah, that would be fantastic. But you know, and, and, and I'm watching Ellen's uh, writing in the chat. They're really the bottom line, and I don't know if there's a movement towards this, even within scrutineers, I, I think there might be a small movement, but in the end, we really need hand-counted paper ballots in, in person. I mean, really, is that the only way to, 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 to avoid all this mess? But I'd take the online because, I mean, you could go there and you could count every single one and you could make sure they're... Ellen's point, well. though, is that every time you run the ballot, you get a different result. Absolutely. Especially, I don't know, but... Especially the absentee ballot. Well, and one of the things that's really that, and this is actually something that you could advocate for where you are. Remember I said that on that spreadsheet, you don't see the voter's name, but instead there's a number. Mm -hmm. The system that you have, the ESNS DS200, as I understand it, is set up to be able to stamp that same number onto the ballot as it's scanned through. So that technically you could match an individual ballot image with the ballot that it was created from. But according to John Brakey of Audit Elections USA, that's, bring, that's brought the, the ballot image preservation lawsuit, in a lot of places, the, the ink cartridge is removed from those machines so that they don't do that printing. So if you could get that to happen, if you could get a way to make sure that the ink cartridges are in the machines, maybe find a way to find out who are poll workers and make sure that they're checking for that when they arrive, you know, when they open up the polling place on election morning, oh, that's then that. something that that's actually a really important part of being able to use ballot images for verification of elections. Emily, what were you saying about printing out the, uh, from the ballot image law? Okay. So, so the way, the way the system is designed, the, some of these, the digital scanners that scan paper ballots is when a ballot is fed in, an image is created that is the thing that the votes on the image are what's counted. And, right. and, and those images are numbered. So each image has, okay. it has its own number right. and the, the scanner has the capacity to print that same number onto the ballot that the image was made from. So okay. that if you, let's say, um, you count the ballot images in Teresa's race and you discover that the official total is really diff very different from what you got, that you would be able to actually take the ballots that you had reason to call into question the ballot images and find the paper ballots that correspond to those images and correct, see correct. If, there's, if they've been changed. Absolutely. When, we, when, you, when you digitize an image, it's exactly the 
same serial number and everything on there should be that you actually print out. I mean, the, the digital ballot images, it's just a copy when, you, when you're at right. the same right. but, but because, a copy. But because there is conceivably the possibility that you could be given a set of ballot images that aren't the real ones. If you're really performing, using them to perform an, a, a community audit, you need to compare a statistically significant number of those images to the original ballots. And that really requires that that, that, that inkjet cartridge be in the machine and the numbers be stamped onto the ballot. So that's another election protection um, activity to do, in case you weren't doing enough. Right. <laughs> yeah, we can, um, a million dollars. Okay. When we Perry. did our, um, this is Perry. Uh, yeah, I know. It's good to see you here. Yeah, when we did our um, poll tape review in March, uh, that was some of the information that we took notes on. And so we also included the serial number. Uh, and so I guess the follow up that we should do is send that list to the SOE's office now and say, hey, look, we noticed these print cartridges uh, did not have, you know, good ink because when we mm -hmm. videotaped it, it came out really light. And so, uh, again, it was just one of the data points that, you know, we decided we needed to add. So. Great. That's great that you're paying attention to that. And one thing I wanted to add is Audit Elections USA, which is at auditelectionsusa.org, which again is the, the organization that, that really is leading this lawsuit about the preservation of ballot images. I used, to, I used to be on their team. I used to be their communications director. And one of the things that, that we did when I worked with them is that we developed some tools to use to help work with ballot images. One of which is um, when, when you have that spreadsheet that I talked about, a tool that will create a hyperlink for each ballot image to its number on the spreadsheet so that if you have a question about one of the images based on what you see on the spreadsheet, you just click on the number and it will open up the image. And it also allows you to do a random draw of a certain percentage of ballots if you wanted to only count a percentage and not all of them and things like that. So if you're interested in working with ballot images after next week's election or any election, I would really recommend talking with them about the possibility of using that tool. Absolutely. They also have on their website a guide to um, a guide for candidates and communities that want to do ballot image audits that help you understand what that involves, what it is, what are the indications that it might be a good thing to do. And you can download that from their website, which again is auditelectionsusa.org. I'll put it in the chat. And then I was told, I think the man's name was Andy, wrote some software that, like, let's say we can't get, in November, right, he's talking about not saving ballot images, but we could get all the clear ballot scans, that somebody wrote a, a, a software that will sort them and, and count them for us, because clear ballot ah, doesn't count, uh, it just stores it. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. It's not Andy, it's, it's Ray, Ray right. Lutz, yeah. um, who is with a group called... Citizens Oversight, they're out of San Diego, and he has a company that he started called Audit Engine. And I'm not sure of the URL for that. I don't think it's just auditengine.org or .com. Um, that, so they, are, they have developed a way to count the votes on ballot images, to basically to provide that kind of um, auditing process. They don't have the capacity to do anything near the whole country yet. They, they need more people and more money and more computer power to be able to, to get anywhere near that, but they will be able to do some races this year. Well, I was told what I needed was um, the templates and the ballot style, the ballot styles and the templates. Would that be enough to maybe use this software or probably still not enough? I don't know. All right, I'll get in touch with them. Thank you. Okay, sure. Okay. All right. I have a lot of information. Thank you. <laughs> sure. You're so welcome. And thanks for inviting me. All right. Anybody else got questions? 
Emily, thank you. And I know that you had a, a pretty bad fall, and we, we thank you for coming out anyway. And, and you It was a minor fall. It was a, a minor furniture assembly accident yesterday <laughs> that got me feeling sore and tired today. So I am going to jump off, and I'm going to be fine. I'm, nothing's broken. Thank you so much for coming. Except the furniture. Um, you're, you're so welcome. Thanks for the work that you're doing. And I would love to see some of you in scrutineers again. It's a good time to join because we've got an orientation tomorrow morning. So, or tomorrow, I guess it's afternoon for you. Hey, before you go, will you put up the, the link to your site in the chat, please? I did. I just okay. did. Okay, good. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Emily, I want to stick around. I just got some things. Bye-bye. I'm actually running for supervisor of elections here in Broward County, and I just joined scrutineers. Great. Thanks so much. And good luck. Yeah. Good luck. Joe's, Joe's got this, man. We got this. <laughs> All right. Take care, Emily. Thanks, Thanks so much. Tom. You take care, too. Yeah. Bye. Bye. You know, since we don't have the crowd, I was open for, I'm going to say goodnight to everybody. There's two things I want to say before I say goodnight, if I can get it up here. Um, and it, did uh, Linda Thompson go away? Yeah, she's not. Linda Gonzalez, is she still with us? Oh, it's too bad. We just endorsed Linda Gonzalez. All right. Woo <laughs> from the state level. And what else? There's another endorsement. That's something I wanted to make. Um, that's it. I do want to say that um, we're going to be organizing a watch party for the November election. And um, before we reach out to organiz other organizations, we're going to need people. Uh, uh, what I, this is my concept, and I know people don't necessarily get in my head when I talk, <laughs> but um, so it'd be like a 20 hour thing while we're, where we're watching the poll results, but it'd be like a telethon. If you've ever seen the Jerry Lewis telethon, where in between all those opportunities to see the results, we'll have little pieces of entertainment. Maybe somebody can do a little cooking demonstration and provide the recipe ahead of time. Maybe you've got like a, a spoken word or a song you want to do or, or, and I want to, <laughs> thank you for laughing. I like that. Um, but I want to give like maybe 10 or 12 other organizations an opportunity also to take like 20, each organization could have 15 or 20 minutes to do either informational piece or, or organize some kind of enter entertainment piece. So before we start reaching out to other organizations, I'd like to ask people within our realm, if there's something you'd like to contribute, whether it be two minutes or 10 minutes, or, you know, you have an organization that definitely wants to jump on for a 20 minute segment, please get to get to us now before we start reaching out. So we'll make sure there's room for everybody in that. And I know it's kind of early, but this is a time that this is the time when we're all kind of talking to each other. You know, we're out and we're all in these pages where we see each other. And uh, so if anybody starts talking about what are you doing for the uh, watch party or for November, you can say, hey, we're going on to like the Progressive Coalition's watch party. And we're going to have like this, this telethon. And I don't know if we'll try to raise money for Mitchell's scholarship, maybe, or something like that. So just think about it. And if you have some ideas, please, please email me. And if you've got something that you want to do so we can save some time for you, that'd be great. And if everybody here has not yet uh, sent me their name and number and precinct number that you live in, and uh, please do so that we can get you signed up for election night. You know, there's there's a um, on maps, there's, and I'll get you the link to it. There's a, a a maps app that just shows you voting precincts. So you might go to your precinct at night and take that picture, but the next morning, if you're going to 7-Eleven. You open up maps and you look for things along the way. I hit about 15 different precincts on my way from my house to the beach last night just by using that map set. So don't think that, you know, even if you get the one, that's great. If you can just do the one, fantastic. But if you're out, you know, the next morning and you can hit a couple more just by seeing what's in your neighborhood or, you know, a couple blocks away, that'd be great. But make sure I get your information so we can get you signed up, okay? Anybody want to add something? Carolyn? Yeah. Hey, goodbye. I have to. I have to go. Of course, that day we're going to have a, a little segment, and we're going to talk about the importance of Medicare for all and what is it that we're doing to try to get to that. Okay, you got it. Great. All right, bye. Thank Anybody you, else? Bye. Good night. Hey, um, Richard, did you want to say something about the? You got. You still got an event coming up? Sure. No, and 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 and, and, and also, I mean, uh, on that on that thing, I, um, that you that activity you want to do. Uh, I could probably do some uh, little piece on labor or union, you know, education Good. or something. Okay, like well, then I'll, I'll definitely put you down, and when we start putting it together, I'll make sure we have. Yeah, some you just let me know. Fun. No, um, we're we're you know, um, my Richard Keith Coase is I'm with the Laborers International Union, and I'm also the vice president of the AFL CIL, and I sit on both Broward and Miami Dade uh, boards, and I just wanted to say we're doing a lot of caravans around right now we're doing a lot of uh since the social distancing we have so many people out of work and uh this buckled unemployment system and the heroes act being sit down uh, held up in the senate for about 90 days now 
and people losing the six hundred dollars. It's been it's been really it's really been rough on people, and especially now, the parents have to go back to uh, teaching from home. You know, it's 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 a lot of you know stress on the family, right? So we've been doing caravans, attacking Rick Scott, Marco Rubio, uh, a good progressive candidate. Uh, we're 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 we're, uh, we're doing that, and we're we're going to be doing another one right now against Rick Scott. Um, Marco Rubio and our main target is uh, um, Governor DeSantis uh, on all the deaths and all the negligence that they've done. And, and uh, we have a, personally, I've lost three co-workers in construction to COVID. So we're going to, we want to try to do a caravan with a hearse and body bags and try to make some type of, we haven't uh, really decided on how for okay. sure. Thank you, everybody, for your time and great presentation with everything you guys did here. Good job. Oh, thank you. Good to see you, Wendy. Georgina, nice to see you, meet you. Hi. And I'll Have say good goodnight. night, everybody. Bye. Hey, good luck, guys. We won't see you before Tuesday. You better rock this thing. We got you. We got you. Go, Joe. Go, Teresa. Woo! Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yes, good luck, Joe. Have, does anybody have any stories from early voting? Oh, Ellen's going to be on the right end, but you're not on the right end until, until November, right? Well, I'm a writing candidate in November. In November. Okay. Good luck, guys. Nonpartisan. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. I am having dinner. <laughs> Good night, Terry Beth. <laughs> <laughs> All your friends to vote, everybody. Make sure you can.